All right. All the glitches have been fixed, and we are now ready to go. Uh, thank you all for coming on, on such a rainy day and being here. Uh, great turnout. Uh, thank you. Uh, welcome to our first of our annual Dr. Nekati Ozisik uh, Distinguished Lecture Series. Uh, Dr. Ozisik uh, was a longtime faculty member in our department. Uh, more, most people were not here, maybe s few people were here um, that knew him. Uh, I actually met him in 96 and actually came here for an interview for assistant professor. So that's the only chance, only chance time I ever met him. Uh, but Dr. Ozisik is very well known in the heat transfer world uh, for his in immense contributions. And uh, uh, before I get further, I want to uh, the, uh, give a person, the, give the person who set up the Ozisik lecture, uh, his son, Dr. Hakan Ozisik, to come and say a few words. Thank you, everybody, for coming out. Uh, it's, I'm, I'm really excited about getting this going, um, and I'm also excited about how fast this got turned around. Uh, I have to thank Dr. Ecad and Luke, uh, Lucas Carpenter for getting this turned around. Uh, I decided I finally wanted to do this, and it got going in uh, late 22, and so I'm very excited to get this going. And it's really, uh, I think, an appropriate way to honor his legacy and also uh, to, to remember him. Um, his accomplishments, you can read that. That's not what I want to talk about. I want to talk about my father more as, as a person. And yes, you know, the, the things he did were incredible. I'm, uh, I'm still amazed at what he's been able to do and what he did with his career coming from Turkey to the United States and uh, working through ASHRAE, Oak Ridge National Laboratories, and eventually coming to NC State in 63. But uh, one of the things he always uh, said was that he always wanted to do the best job he could do no matter what he did. And, and that's something that he always carried regardless of what he did. But in addition to that, you can't really get to where you are with just doing the best. That, that's something you need to have. But um, he had an incredible drive and passion for the work he was doing. Uh, he enjoyed it. it was, for him, it was not work. It was, it was he enjoyed doing uh, what he was doing, and he loved it. Uh, just to give you an idea, I mean, every morning he was definitely old school. He would put on a coat and tie. He'd be up at 7 at the university, 7, 7.30, and he would, uh, he would stay all day at the, uh, at, in his office working, teaching courses, working with graduate students, and he'd be there till 5 or 6 at night. And then he'd come home in the evening. We'd have dinner. We'd have family time, but then he would go back uh, downstairs to his office, which uh, he was very passionate about having a, a good office, a good working place. And he made sure he had built-in bookshelves, and he wanted to have a library, so he had all access to all his books there whenever he could. Uh, he wanted to get them. Of course, it wasn't the internet where you could go look up stuff, so you had to actually get books from the library. But he had everything there. And um, he would always be working. He would start working probably 8, 9 o'clock at night. and easily one, two, sometimes three in the morning, but I'll tell you, he would be back up and ready to go at seven in the morning. And that's Monday through Friday, and on the weekends, he took a little bit of a break. Uh, and, and again, he's doing this because he's just so passionate about what he's doing, he, he really loved what he's doing. And he would work on, on the weekends, he would work on his books, his research papers, he'd have uh, conversations with colleagues and, um, and, and his graduate students. But, uh, what he really, really enjoyed, and all that is great, but he certainly enjoyed his collaboration with his colleagues. He enjoyed going to conferences, working with people, uh, having working relationships. But what I noticed most of all was uh, his working relationship with his students. Um, I spent a lot of time in his office, and he was, he was very passionate about working with his students especially his graduate students, his PhD students, his master's students, and he would spend whatever time uh, was needed with them, whether it's in the office or whether it's on the phone, talking to them in the evenings. And, uh, you know, his, his interaction was, 
he had so much confidence in what he was doing and he knew his subject matter so well and he, had, he, he would never, I would say, get down or lose confidence at any point. And I think that confidence and uh, the way he carried himself, that really influenced his students. And when you're, when you're a graduate student, you're doing a master's or a PhD, sometimes I can tell you for myself, you go, man, I, I don't know how I'm gonna finish this up. How's it gonna, is, is it actually gonna close? And to have an advisor who would actually give you the confidence, and he had a roadmap. He had this all worked out in his head. He knew what the end point was. It's just the student would have to put in the hard work and he would get there. And uh, that was really, uh, you know, his enthusiasm was infectious and you could see it. And I think uh, the last thing I really want to say is uh, the, the, great, the greatest thing was for me is watching the transition to go from advisor student to colleague. And you can see that today, even after he retired, uh, he had, he, there were so many people in different universities and research positions, and, and that's really a wonderful thing. So it, any, anyways, thank you very much for coming. I'm excited to get this going. I'd like to get this going, and I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Ecad to uh, uh, introduce our distinguished speaker today. Uh, thank you, Akan. So when uh, Hakan and I talked about this in November, uh, and uh, he told me I want to do this, and I said, of course, I'm a heat transfer person, I have used his book, so I was very excited to have uh, an autistic lecture here in our department. And he said, uh, how soon can you do it? I said, this spring. And he said, are you sure? I said, yes, because I know a person who says, he will come the moment I say an Ecardi autistic lecture. So I was pretty confident who it was. So I called Professor Jaluria and I, I sent him an email and I said, would you be interested? I think within 10 minutes or 15 minutes, I got an email saying, of course I will do it. So I'm very, very pleased to have uh, uh, Dr. Jaluria here today with us. And uh, it's interesting the way it is like, my, my uh, heat transfer career started uh, right after almost Dr. Kozic's career in, uh, in, prof in the academic profession ended. But, Dr. Jaluria is kind of bridging the gap between the two of us. He's, he's been around when he was an assistant professor with Dr. Ozisik, and now today he's a, he's a distinguished professor at Rutgers. So I'm really excited to have somebody uh, of the stature of Dr. Jaluria to come and uh, give a talk here. So I'm gonna quickly read a couple of things uh, from his uh, bio here. Uh, we didn't put it on the card there, but Dr. Jaluria is, uh, if you take any heat transfer award in the world, Dr. Jaluria has got it. So that's the prime reason why uh, you know, it, it makes great sense to have him here. He is uh, extremely passionate about heat transfer and he also knows the history of heat transfer. So another reason why he's here is he can talk about how heat transfer has developed and what heat transfer contributions are in different areas because he's worked in like convection, fires, materials processing, thermal management, electronics, energy, environment. His uh, PhD dissertation was on natural convection in, uh, in the 1970s. So, so he's done so much work on ma uh, heat transfer in manufacturing. Uh, and all this uh, are evident in uh, over 10 books, uh, 230 journal papers, uh, 22 book chapters, uh, patents and uh, copyrighted software. And then, of course, the awards. Uh, he's pretty much, like I said, uh, the highest honor in heat transfer is the Max Jakob Award. Uh, he received that, which is given by both ASME and AICHE. Uh, he's received uh, the Heat Transfer Memorial Award uh, before that. He's got the Holly Medal, uh, A.V. Luikov Award from uh, International Center for Heat and Mass Transfer, Donald Kern Award, ha Robert Henry Thurston Lecture Award. So the, the list goes on. But more importantly, like I said, the reason I, I think Dr. Jaluria is the right person to give is because he knows the history of heat transfer and he knows the contributions of all the stalwarts of heat transfer, especially Professor Ozisik. So I turn it over to Professor Jaluria to give us this lecture and please uh, invite him with a round of applause. Oh, you got it.
Good morning. Uh, I hope uh, yeah, this is working. Uh, it's certainly a great honor for me to be here uh, to speak uh, in a lecture series which is named after uh, Professor Ozesek. Uh, as Srinath mentioned, I've been around for more years than I'd like to remember, but I've known uh, Professor Ozesek for, for many, many years. We interacted in many different ways, in conferences, in meetings, uh, workshops. Uh, at one point, we had the same funding agency, so we ended up with many workshops for that funding agency. And of course, I've used many of his books and papers over the years. We interacted in areas of uh, mutual interest, uh, in conduction, in uh, uh, computational heat transfer, which I've been very interested in, uh, and so on. Uh, so it has been certainly a great uh, pleasure for me uh, to talk to him, talk about him, and certainly meeting Hakan yesterday was, was quite a, a pleasant experience. And I've also met several other faculty members. So it's, it's good to, to be in this university and then give this talk. I'll try to keep track of uh, the time. Uh, let me start first by this picture. This picture is actually a fairly classic. It's 1985. It was in uh, Cheshme, Turkey. It was a natural convection workshop for two weeks. And that was the time when I, as you can see, Professor Ozesek in the corner of the right, uh, we spent two weeks together uh, in a beautiful resort in Turkey. And that was my first interaction with Professor Ozesek, even though I had already used his heat transfer book in my, my courses. Um, people in heat transfer might recognize a lot of people here. Chang Tian is here, uh, Ben Gebhardt is there, uh, Kakach, uh, Spalding, and so on. You can, uh, Crete, most of you would know about the Crete. Uh, Vishkanta in the second row. Uh, I'm standing next to him. I can hardly recognize myself because it's 35 uh, years ago or whatever. So I was a relatively young guy uh, looking at all these great people with awe. So it's, it's that kind of a picture. Uh, it's certainly something which uh, reminds me that indeed there were stalwarts and then giants, Professor Ozesing being one of them, a uh, giant in the field of heat transfer. Uh, heat transfer has grown tremendously from the time that I started uh, in early uh, 70s. And it has now, in almost any field you pick up, from bio to energy to environment, climate change, anything you want to talk about, materials, it's heat transfer is, is important. And that's why uh, it's important to talk about these people who have contributed so much. And certainly, Professor Hosek is one of the leaders in, in that field. And certainly, as Hakan mentioned, his uh, discipline is something that we can all uh, aspire for. He would, uh, I mean, he used to tell me also when we, when we met exactly what Hakan said, that he would get up in the morning and would write, uh, write a book. Uh, we were comparing notes, and I said, yes, I also get up in the morning, but I didn't have the discipline to go after dinner to continue my book. Uh, I, after dinner, I was back on the TV and watching uh, the comedy shows and so on. Okay, so that's uh, there what happened. So these are some of the books that he has written, and many, many papers, a whole range of papers. Uh, as I said, many different areas that we interacted with. The finite difference method, because of my interest in computational heat transfer, we interacted. Heat transfer, I used as a, as a textbook, conduction, I used as a textbook, and so on. And today I'm going to talk about inverse heat transfer, which is an area which he kind of spearheaded with, along with a couple of other people, and an area which is very important. I'll try to give you some examples, talk about why this area is important, and what kind of uh, achievements have been made in this, what needs to be done. Uh, it's it's an area by itself. And it is interesting when you talk about inverse problems. Uh, doctors are solving inverse problems all the time. You give them the symptoms and they have to find out where it is coming from. And that is the kind, and it's, it's a non-unique problem. When you say I have a pain in my shoulder, the doctor has to figure out why that pain and where is it coming from. And that's typically an inverse problem. In engineering, we have a lot of inverse problems and that's how we got interested in that. So let me talk a little bit about that. Uh, the forward problems are where you give all the boundary conditions and you solve the problem. And that can be solved by analysis, by numerical methods, experimentally or whatever. It's straightforward. It's, uh, at least today, it's become quite straightforward. But the inverse problem is where you know the result and you want to find out what will get you to that result. What kind of boundary conditions will get you to that result? And that opens up a whole field of knowledge where you are trying to solve the problem trying to find out what is needed so that you can achieve the aims that you have. And there are many, many examples that can be picked up where this can be done. This is one example, for instance. You have plumes rising from uh, a factory or, or a fire or whatever. You want to find out where the fire is. You want to find out how big that fire is. 
can we measure temperature or concentration at some point and thus determine what the source is, how big it is, where is it? And that becomes an inverse problem because to know how the plume will behave is a direct problem. But once the plume is set up, can we trace back and find out where the source is? Same thing with electronics. You have data centers here, uh, you have a hotspot. Where does this hotspot come from? How can you get rid of the hotspot? What needs to be changed to get to a situation that is acceptable? So that's obtain source, temperature, and location using data downstream, or find conditions which will meet the requirement. One interesting problem, which is very common in industry, is what is called annealing. We do it for copper, we do it for aluminum, for steel, we have steel. You heat steel up to a temperature like 700, and then you stay for a while, and then you cool it very, very slowly, mainly to get rid of all the stresses in it. Now we know what we need to do, so this is our result. We already know the result. We know that we want to heat it up to 700, we want to stay for a while, and we can decide how much time we need. That is not a very difficult problem, and how slowly should we cool it? But again, how do we treat it? So this was a steel industry project. Let me do this. Uh, this is a annealing uh, furnace, which is something like about six to seven meters high. So very big. This is an actual one in, a, in the steel plant. And you have big rollers. These things that you see here are long sheets of steel which are rolled up into rolls, and there are three of them. And the only heating is from burners coming from here. These are coming from the blast furnace. What you want to do is to heat this whole thing uniformly, more or less, to 700, and then cool it very, very gradually. So again, the problem is complicated. Still, you can de develop a model. You can solve the heat transfer problem. So solving the heat transfer with numerical methods, with experimental inputs, with property data, is not as challenging as the inverse is. So you get this result. You s and the first thing, of course, is to get the behavior in the foils, how in these foils, how they are behaving, what temperature profile is there, and so on. A comparison with the experiment to validate it, and so on. So the first step is this. You get the direct problem, validate it. You know your numerical model is working. But the main thing is the inverse problem. And the inverse problem, interestingly, is all determined by a thermocouple here. This thermocouple at the bottom is the control thermocouple. You, by controlling it, you control the whole process. So what we did was we, this was years before many of the inverse problem uh, methodology had come out. So you just put different kinds of profiles for the control thermocouple and saw what was happening in the coil. So this was solving the inverse problem, but without a very systematic approach. We were basically just trying different cases. It's a non-unique problem. You cannot just put anything and get a solution. That would be the case. It's not the direct problem. So you put different shapes, different profiles to see what's happening. And that's what we did. And it turns out that we ultimately, after a lot of effort over two, three years, we did find what the profile should be like. So this is the control thermocouple. Numerically, we found it simply by putting different profiles and looking at the coil. So we're trying to solve the inverse problem, but by simply putting different inputs. That's input, output. We're taking that output. We're trying to change this thermocouple to get it. And we found that finally it does agree with the experiment. So that was a typical problem in inverse that you need. Let me move on to another problem, which I just referred to earlier. You have a plume. You have a jet in cross flow. We want to f measure temperature somewhere downstream and then want to find out where that jet is, how big that jet is, or a source, where is that source is. Now, this would apply to electronic systems, it'll apply to fires, it'll apply to many different cases. For instance, it'll apply to this train derailment. The train derailment we just had, you have a fire and you have a plume for that. Nobody wants to go near that fire because obviously it's toxic. But can we stay hundreds of yards, meters away from it, measure the temperature and the concentration, and say where it is, and how big is it, and how is it changing with time. And that's where the inverse problem comes in, that you measure the temperature, you solve the problem backwards, you find out where the source is. The same thing happens to the World Trade Center. It was a plume which lasted for months. Again, one of the major problems was to find out what is the energy release, how much is being released. The location was known, but how much was being released. Again. Inverse problem, measure the temperatures and go back and do it. So what we did was we designed an experimental system. This is a small wind tunnel. 
We have heat sources, as you can see here. Uh, the heat sources, I don't know if this will work. Well, it should. The heat sources are there, right here. And we have the wind tunnel coming in. This is the experiment which we did. And we also did a numerical computation. So we did uh, both of them. And we ended up looking at the situation. As I said, you get the temperature field experimentally and numerically. But the first major thing is to solve the direct problem. This is the direct problem. You solve the problem looking at how the temperature behaves, what is the temperature profile, validate the thing, and so on. So the first part is straightforward. It is solving the direct problem. Once you solve the direct problem, you have results like this. You have how the temperature will behave if the source temperature changes or the heat flux changes. All those results can be obtained numerically very easily. Now comes the hard part. You have to reverse, to go back. You want to take temperatures somewhere out there and find out where the source is and how big the source is. So what you can do is, what we did initially was to put three thermocouples horizontally and three vertically, actually five thermocouples, and look at the temperature and try to go back. It turned out to be a totally non-unique problem. We ended up with a very strange result. We could not locate the source. We could not locate, get the source value and so on. So you have to have optimization. Otherwise, you could have this plume that I was showing uh, for the train derailment or the World Trade Center. You could spend days looking at all kinds of measurements, the data mining and putting AI and machine learning and so on. You still would not be able to capture it. You really need to optimize. You can't go and measure hundreds and hundreds of points. It becomes much more difficult experimentally. So you need to optimize it. Instead of this, why not that? Why not the other one? Why should we put it in this form? And that's where we spent a lot of our time. How do you optimize these locations? And once you optimize, how accurately can you predict backwards? So this is what we found. Initially, we had this. But finally, we ended up with those blue points. We just needed those three. Instead of all these points here, just those three gave us the same result. Once you optimize it, the number of points needed and the accuracy is much, much higher. So this is what happens. The region of uncertainty, because of your data, drops sharply when you go to optimization. Again, region of uncertainty becomes almost like a point. Your accuracy improves tremendously by optimizing. It turned out that for that plume that I was showing, it's a strange shape. Something in horizontal, something in vertical, but not right angle. It is in a curved shape, which picks up the best. When, why does it happen? It has to do with sensitivity of the problem. When the direct problem is solved, there is a sensitivity involved with every temperature data. And that's what gives you the optimized value. I'll show you some results. Uh, this is what we got with the original shape. And when we optimize the shape, look at the accuracy. Instead of 12% error, we get 0.6% error. And we are actually using fewer uh, points. So look at this again. You have all this error. But the optimized one gives you a very high accuracy. Yeah, this is a table. Again, this is jet. We tried to do the same thing in the jet. Again, good accuracy with optimized data. Okay? And again, let me forget about that. Now, that was the second problem that I was talking about. Then we started thinking that we became a little ambitious. We said, okay, we should do that. Why not do more? We started looking at fires. One of the major, because I was interested in fires, one of the major problems in fires is if there's a fire in this building, you don't want to go into the building. You don't want to go into the room. You want to measure temperatures and velocities, maybe at the door, maybe on the wall, to find out how big the fire is. If you've seen the old movie Backdraft, you might realize that it could be a fire which is about to explode, or there may be a flashover coming up. So the question is, can we measure temperatures? to find out where the fire is, how big the fire is. And the same thing applies for electronic systems. Can we instrument it so that we can see where the hotspot is? Without basically getting into it. So these are all fires. Uh, these are the lower ones are all simulations. Up there are actual experiments. Uh, building in Baltimore was uh, on fire and uh, data was were taken. Okay, so this is a room fire. Can we put thermocouples all velocity measurements at the door, at the wall, on the floor, on the ceiling, which will instrument and tell us what's happening. Now, this would apply, as I said, to data centers. It'll apply to electronics uh, in, a, in a room, avionics. It'll apply also to the possibility of fire might exist. 
to put all that. But the problem is a very complicated one because this is convection. We're not talking about a simple, well, I should say simple, but we're not talking about something which is not moving. Here, air is moving or combustion products are moving. And as you go up in temperature or heat source, there are circulation set up. And you could go from laminar to turbulent or laminar to transition to turbulent. And you end up with circulation which will be different. So the pattern of the flow changes as you go up with the heat flux. Your location could be very different. You put a fire here or you put a fire here, uh, is sensitivity enough to do it? So what we said is that the problem is complicated. Let's pick up a simple problem and see if you can develop the strategy to do it. So we picked up a very simple problem. It's a wall flume. It's a wall flume. There's a fire or a heat source at the bottom. And we just want to find out, can we determine how strong this is, how good it is, by simply measuring temperature? So the first step, of course, is that we go ahead and solve the problem. We did laminar, the turbulence, an experiment, and so on. So I'll go through some of them as much as I can. Uh, uh, so let me talk about the laminar. First thing, calculate the thing, get the results on it, validate it, and you can see the validation, obviously, is important. And the temperature field, this is the temperature varying from the surface outside, and the previous one was the velocity on the, on the wall because of the wall plume. So you used to compare it, you validate it. Then if you look at the temperature, you measure the temperature at any given point on the wall, this is the typical profile you get. You see a, basically a transient which starts at a certain point because when, the, when you turn on the uh, source, there is a bubble which is rising. Now I shouldn't say a bubble, but a pocket of fluid which is hot, which is rising. And this pocket gradually goes up and ultimately sets up a steady state situation. So you end up with steady state finally, but initially there's a transient. So just keep this a transient mind. We'll come back to it. There's a transient and then ultimately a steady state. So let's first work with the steady state. The Brashoff number gives you the source strength, how strong the source is. L gives you the location, where it is. Let's see if we can get those two. So we are talking about steady state. This you can see the bubble going up. You can see the bubble. This is how it goes up. And that's the transient. The moment it hits there, you, the other one starts moving. That's where it starts. And then ultimately, as you can see, as it exits, you have a nice boundary layer, and you end up with a nice steady state situation. So this is a typical, this is a typical natural convection wall flume, which is a fire in a corner, flow rising exactly the same, electronic source on a wall, the same. Okay. So what happens is you get data. You look at temperature, you're now again completing the simulation. You get a lot of simulation. We're not getting into data mining, but we get simulation. And then we curve fit it. So now we have input, output, we curve fit it. With the Rayleigh number or Brasher number giving the source strength and L giving the, or X giving the location. So you end up with a <coughs> curve fit. Now, you have to calculate these two quantities, X and Rayleigh number to get the result. Where do we get these X values or where do we measure the temperature? Now from the plume, the wall, I mean the fire is in the corner, if the wall is 10 feet or whatever, where do we measure the temperature? If you measure it at random, the accuracy is essentially zero. I mean you really get nothing. It's, it's, it's a very non-unique problem, you'll get answers which are not correct. So we need to optimize the point, where should we measure it? And for that, we use a method which many of you are familiar with called particle swarm optimization. For those who are not familiar, it's a very interesting phenomena. It's based on birds looking for food. So if you have a swarm of birds or flies or whatever looking for uh, food, one of the scouts says, oh, there is food, so the whole swarm moves in that direction. And then another scout says, it's there, it moves in that direction. So it's the swarm and the particle interacting with each other and they ultimately zero in on the source. So it's a natural phenomena. Uh, we might have seen birds coming and coming to food. You can try it at home, throw a little bit of bread outside and you'll see this kind of a swarm coming in. That is what gives rise to this interesting optimization. You can choose particle and ultimately find out which is the best one. And that's what we have done. So we basically choose random particles, look at which particle is good, which particle will lead to a better situation, and then the whole swarm moves in that direction, and so on. This is what is happening. All the swarm is coming together, ultimately collapsing at that particular point. 
it's an interesting uh, situation. There's an objective function which we define, which is basically based on the Rayleigh number, which is the source strength, uh, location, which is based on x. And using this goodness factor, you can call it a, a, a niceness factor or optimization factor, this tells you how the particle behaves. So one particle looks at it and says, oh, that's the good one. The whole swarm moves in. The swarm looks at it, and there's a communication going on. So you can see there's a particle position, path direction, weight, weight, and so on, and best position of the swarm. So ultimately, you reach that point. Uh, the math is a little bit uh, involved. I'm not getting into it. But ultimately, you get the best position of the particle. So by this, you can choose the best location. You can choose best one location, two locations, three, four, whatever you like. You can choose. It's like starting with 100 particles and going down to two or three. And once we did that, we found that that's the optimum that you'll get. I'll show you what happens. When we tried many iterations, the same optimum appears. So we picked up a particular condition, and we tried to find out where the optimum is. And it was interesting that whatever the source is, wherever it is, there was a particular location where the optimum existed, where the optimum location can be found. So what happened is, here are the equations. We go through the equations. We picked up two locations, which are the optimum, and found the result. And we found that these two will tell you everything that you need. But they are optimum locations. Why are they optimum? Because at that point, the objective function is the best. And the entire swarm has come to that objective function. OK? So let's see. This is the laminar steady state. If you have only one source, only the one uh, problem, source strength, you just need one source, one uh, point. You don't need two points. You just need one point. And that one point, that point 0.98L, is actually the optimal location. Just one will give you the answer. So if you had a fire here and you had one on the right point, it'll tell you how big the fire is or the heat input. If you have a location problem, again, just one. But it has to be at the optimum. It turns out that the two optimum are not the same. And if you have two unknowns, then you put those two locations, you'll get the source, and that, and the accuracy is very, very high. As you can see, the accuracy with just two sensors, the location and the strength is given. OK, now this is steady state. Most of the fires are transient. You want to run out of the room when the fire starts. You don't want to stay there. So you are interested in transient. Similarly, electronic. You turn the electronic on, it burns immediately if you don't stop it. So it's the transient which is very important. So we said, OK, let's go to the transient. This is the transient I was showing you before. You have a transient starting at a particular point. That's one input you can use. It goes to an overflow or overshoot, you can pick that as a criterion. Or when that overshoot appears, that time, you can choose. So there are three or four items which can be used as a criterion for optimizing. So what we did, again, uh, we looked at many others, but we decided to look at one other. And that's what we chose, the time when that peak appears. It appeared that, again, that was independent of the source location and the strength. That's why we choose, uh, chose it. If it was dependent on source length and, and so on, it would not serve the purpose. It has to be reasonably uh, universal. OK? So this, again, we do all the calculations. We have temperature at that point, that time that we had. How does it vary with source strength? How does it vary with source flux? How does it vary with source location? You get all the data. So it's not, not a big deal. And then we surfeit it with the location and the source strength. Again, the Ashford number and, and the length. And then again, here we go. Single source strength. Again, it's almost the old value. The optimum is very, very close to that. With the single source location, again, it's different. But with that particular location, you will get exactly where the source location is, and very accurately. And similarly, if you have two of them, have two locations or three locations, you'll get the best. It turned out that two sensors were not good enough. I mean, they gave you ac some accuracy. But there were areas where they were not accurate. With four sensors, actually with even three, it gave excellent uh, value, particularly for the location. Here you can see, again, four sensors, extremely accurate. So in most cases, we found that if you are looking only for the source strength and you know the location, you can do it with only one or two sensors very, very, very nicely. So if you had this uh, frame derailment, you know where it is. You just want to know how strong it is. Taking a few data points at the optimum points will give you the value very nicely. You do not need many uh, optimal points. You just need a couple of optimal points. Maybe three or four would give you an excellent value of the source. 
Plus, remember, this is changing with time. So you will also know how the heat flux changes with time. So in this derailment or even the voltage center, which is closer to, to my home, uh, at that time, we were very worried because the plume was coming all the way, much of it towards New Jersey. And the question was, do we know how much is there? And it took a long time before people could figure out how much energy was being released. If you had something like this, you could have measured in Elizabeth or uh, Hoboken or something and said how much energy is being released. The location was already known. So in that case, it becomes a very major uh, criterion. And that's why we are interested. At the moment, we're looking at some of these uh, two problems that we are talking about, particularly the derailment and also large scale fires. How can we use this for that? We did it for the turbulence model. Let's see, time wise, I'm okay. So turbulence model we solved, we ended up with, again, validation and a very similar situation. Source strength, you end up with accuracy like this. Again, source location, one should do it. And source location, again, we looked at two sensors, we ended up with, this is the optimum, so the location was very accurately obtained, the source was not as accurate. But anyway, in most of these cases, you can come up with the optimal location. If you want to go with three or four sensors, you can actually locate very, very closely where it is and how much strength it has. Okay, finally we did experiment, uh, mainly because numerical tells you what is happening, but you ultimately have to go back to the experiments to see whether it will work or not. We took a plate, as you can see here, we had thermocouples uh, instrumented into it from the backside, and we basically moved the source up and down. We had a source here, which is a heated uh, heater, which we moved up and down, and we did exactly what we did from the numerical code to see whether the results are similar or not. So we did, this is the heat transfer uh, scale, and this is, these are the uh, fluxes. We have removed the radiation. It's only the convective heat flux that we're looking at, because that's what we used for the wall plume. And we ended up, again, looking at the results. First, just measuring the results, and then going to the inverse problem. And here's the inverse problem, as you can see, for the turbulent steady state case. You can see there's an error. And you can see this, these were the errors. But when you went actually to the optimum condition, look at this was not optimum. That was optimum, the accuracy is tremendous. You have converged all the random behavior into one curve. So you are able to predict in a turbulent case also, and an experimental case, the results. Same thing happens if you go to this, this is the, sorry, this is the location. Again, the same thing. Go from a random kind of a thing to an optimum, you get the results. So that's, so basically the message is that in all these cases, you have an inverse problem which is complicated. The direct problem is easily, easy to solve. You have a numerical codes, you have answers, you can have console, you can have MATLAB, whatever, solve it. It's relatively well known. Now most of us can solve it. If you're in CFD, you can solve it. If you're in other areas, you can solve it. But this strategy would work not only for conduction, but it'll also work for radiation and convection. It'll also work for many, many practical processes. But the problem is complicated. So one is not going to fit for all. You will have to look at different aspects. Okay? So that's pretty much there. I'll talk about one additional uh, example, the optical fiber drive pro process. I worked in this area for a, for a fairly long time, and we ran into a problem, and that's why I want to bring it up. This is a drawing furnace. We take glass rod, heat it up to about uh, 2,000 Kelvin, and then pull it, and we make a thin fiber. The, the rod from which it is built is about 10 to 20 centimeter in diameter. The fiber is 125 microns. So very quickly you heat it up, it doesn't melt. Glass really is just solid, uh, uh, softens, and you pull it into an optical fiber. Now the problem is that we don't know the temperature distribution of the wall. The furnace is expensive, extremely expensive. You are not going to make a hole and put a probe in there. There's no way you can do that. So you basically have a furnace. They tell you what the temperature at a given point is. So one point is known. Somewhere in between, they would tell you the temperature is, that's the maximum temperature. But you don't know the distribution. If you don't know the distribution, you cannot simulate the problem. You cannot decide what the shape is. Because in optical fiber, this neck down shape is very important. You cannot calculate the defects. You cannot calculate the stresses. So you need this temperature profile. So this is the boundary condition which is missed. Everything else is known. We have the radiation zone model or uh, any other model that you want to do. You have the convection model. Uh, you have uh, force convection, natural convection. Everything is known. The problem is you don't know the temperature at the wall. So that becomes a problem. 
these are the zone models and you can solve it. And anybody who's done in radiation, you know that it's not, uh, I mean, it's complicated, it takes time consuming, but it can be done. You can get the solution, but you need the temperature. If you take it as uniform temperature, the results are totally wrong. You get the fiber breaking very quickly. So obviously there is a temperature distribution. So what we designed, designed is that we have a radiation model. That's a radiation model, the convection and so on, but we have to solve the inverse problem. We have to find what the temperature is. And that's where a lot of work which Professor Ozizek had done, he used. A lot, I mean, he did uh, gradient-based methods and so on, and many other strategies were available that we decided to use. And that's where we followed some of his work, and we basically did something interesting. Here's the furnace. This is the actual furnace. I don't know, it's not very clear, but there's a furnace here. You can see a rod coming in. What we did was, and I'll show a sketch in a minute. This is the furnace. The furnace is only like about 30 to 40 centimeter in height. But as I said, it's an expensive one because the temperature, the graphite heater goes up to 20, uh, 2,000 to 2,500 uh, Kelvin. Uh, has to be very pure and has to be uh, completely free of impurities and stuff like that. So we put, basically what we did was in that, we put a graphite rod. So what we did is we took, we put a graphite rod. You can see this graphite rod here. We put a graphite rod in the furnace. We put a graphite rod. And this graphite rod is instrumented with thermocouple. You can measure the temperature. So now, that's the reverse problem, inverse problem. You have the temperature on the rod. You don't know what the temperature of the wall is. The temperature at the rod is well known. It's well accurate. Uh, you've measured it. Uh, and most of the equipment is very easy to uh, fab uh, fabricate. So we have the temperature distribution on the rod, which we are comfortable with. That is accurate. Now we want to find the temperature of the wall. And that becomes an inverse problem. Because you know the result, you don't know what's causing it. And that's where we did the usual, as I said, the following uh, Professor Ozisic, we basically took this as a polynomial, varied the parameters using uh, uh, gradient-based methods. Uh, you can even use uh, the algorithm that I was talking about in optimization, the genetical algorithm will work. Many of those work to optimize this profile. And that's what you get in the result. So what you see there, Again, if I can show it from here, you see this, this is the temperature that we measured. So the measuring of the temperature was not a problem. But then this curve that you see here, the, the dark curve, is the actual profile that we calculated from inverse calculation. So it's a polynomial. The two flat portions are simply because the, there are heating, water cooled regions. So those are known, we know knew that. It's this curve that we did not know. Now, as I said, if I just take it as a uniform temperature, the whole thing is inaccurate. We actually ended up with the fiber breaking very quickly. So we knew it's not uniform temperature. It is a peak temperature and so on. The temperature at the maximum, uh, we do have a uh, probe in there. Uh, it's given by the manufacturer. So we can compare and we say, okay, the results are quite good. But ultimately you get the temperature distribution. Once you get the temperature distribution, life is very good. Now you can calculate the, uh, how the uh, free shape comes, what the defects are caused, everything else. So the inverse problem, is a major input into the overall analysis. So this is what you get. This is a furnace set temperature that I show you here. That compares well with what we ended up. And those are the two cases that we picked up. And we ended up with the temperature distribution. So that is how the inverse problem can be used to satisfy the boundary condition which we did not have. Once you have that, then of course the rest of it follows. You get, then we worked on uh, uh, optical fibers, how does it, uh, how will you heat it, uh, how far do you heat it, everything else corresponding to that we were able to do. So I think that's pretty much what I wanted to say. Let me just conclude that inverse problems are frequently encountered. I mentioned doctors, uh, the inverse problems, even when we go shopping, we are doing an inverse problem. We are trying to get this, 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 uh, how much do we have, and uh, things like that we are always doing. We need solutions to get results out of it. Uh, it may be completing a problem, as I just showed, uh, there are constraints on experimental data. You just cannot take infinite data all around. You have to be relatively selective in getting the, the points. And then you need a direct solution. Once you get the direct solution, you can build a system to go back. In one case, we used a predictor corrector. We use the horizontal points to predict, the vertical points to correct. You can use that. In another case, we use optimization to get the data distributions and so on. The solutions are always all non linear. There is almost no inverse problem where the solution will be unique. You'll typically end up with a large number of solutions to pick up the right one. 
it has to be done by optimization. There's almost no other strategy. In one case that I showed, we took many cases and picked up the best. Again, it was not systematic optimization. But if you do systematic optimization, you'll get the right points and you'll get the good value. So you remove the uncertainty and you get a good accurate result. Again, data obtained at chosen locations to solve it and the strategy and results important in environment and safety. I mentioned fires, I mentioned electronics, environmental problems and so on. It is important that the error is minor and if fairly low uncertainty and finally we use sensitivity to make sure that those points are, are good. So with that, uh, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll conclude and then hopefully uh, you enjoyed this talk and thank you very much for your attention. Not too bad in time. Well, thank you very much for the talk. For the, for the glass drawing problem, right, it looks like uh, the temperature is not uniform along the length of the rod. Um, so how will that affect the, the drawing process? Because the temperature will affect the drawing, right? So because for optical fiber, you want to have a uniform diameter. Diameter is uniform, but the temperature is not uniform radially right. or axially. It's, it's varying. Right, right. So the temperature starts almost at 300 Kelvin, and by the time it ends, it's almost at 2,000 Kelvin. So the temperature changes a lot. Right, but that will affect the uniformity of the diameter, right? Because different temperature, my assumption is different temperature will give you different uh, diameter. No, uh, well, it depends on the uh, tension that you put on. A lot of it depends on the tension. What you want it to soften it. So it becomes right. soft at somewhere around 1800, 1700 Kelvin. So, so maybe Once above above the, maybe the... It has to be above the softening point. Once it's above the softening point, it behaves very nicely. And the neck down region basically is the, the stresses help us. Because what happens is that there's all the stresses ultimately come together to balance out the tension that you put in there. And that's how it's controlled so that the, sh the neck down shape is very, very important. And that's where the diameter is controlled. So the control of the diameter is very, very critical. Uh, it's controlled by the tension, controlled by the heat input, controlled by convection. There is an inert environment which is maintained. So all that is there, but the temperature does vary, has to vary. And, and the properties are very heavily temperature dependent. Glass, the properties are exponential, varying with temperature. Right, I guess also the, the strain rate, how fast. Everything, yeah, everything is varying. It's, it's, a, it's a fairly complicated problem, even the direct one. It's right. a pretty complicated problem. Okay, thank you. Okay, great talk. Um, when you're talking about the, um, the, the sensitivity at the end, mm -hmm. is there any way in a, in a real time setting that you can vary the locations to get a better answer? Experimentally, um, if you're doing in a lab, you can do it. If you're looking at an actual situation like the World Trade Center or a derailment, you obviously don't have the choice to move it. So the experiment that I was showing, we did move the source. So it was experimentally in the lab, you could move it. It was not difficult. Numerically, it's no problem. You can just move it very, very easily. So the location and even the experiment, the final experiment showed we did move uh, ourselves. So when you're doing it in a lab or an experimental setup, you can do it. The moment you go to a real life, you obviously can't. You have to depend on what you did in the experiment. Yes, you can do it in real time. You can do it in real time if you are fast enough. I mean, if you have a lab experiment going on, a numerical going on uh, in conjunction, you can do it in real time. But you have to have the two systems ready. Uh, with the World Trade Center, obviously, we were not prepared that the plume would last for such a long time. It was after uh, several months that we started talking about the plume, why it's still going on and so on. And then the source was continuous for a long, long time because it was a smoldering fire which kept on going. And in that case, if by any chance there were measurements done earlier, they might have known that this is going very, very slow. It will last for a very long time. Precautions could have been taken, but uh, it wasn't done at that time. Uh, thank you very much, Professor, for uh, giving the presentation and information. Uh, may you please explain about selecting the optimum locations, about where to take the readings, because and how to decide the objective function? Okay, the objective function, it's up pretty much up to the person. We took it more or less as equal weightage, the location and the source strength as equal location, equal weightage. Now you may be interested only in the source location. 
You may not be interested in the source strength. It depends on what you're interested in. Suppose you're interested in only in the location. Then in that case, you have only one objective function. And then you use a genetic algorithm is probably the best to do it, but we use PSO, which also did very good. So that was with one uh, input. If you have two, we actually combine them into with weighting factor of half in that case. But you can change the weighting factor depending on what your problem is. You can de develop periodo front. You can get a periodo front and you can decide what weighting you would like to use. No, the objective function decided the location. So you choose the objective function and that will yield the, the, two, uh, the locations. So you don't choose the location and it comes out the location. It turns out that once you are at that object uh, optimal location, if you move it around a little bit, it doesn't make much of a difference. So fortunately, it is fairly sturdy. That's why I was showing that with many, many iterations, we still ended up in the same location. So it's physically it goes into that uh, situation. So once you've chosen the objective function, you will end up with those locations. So you, you talk about inverse problem giving you a non-unique solution, mm -hmm. and then you cast the problem into optimization problem. Let's say if you put the, all the physics law into your optimization problem, including like you know, the Galvin equation, et cetera, would you able to guarantee your inverse problem being unique? No, you still would not. Because see, physically, whatever do you do mathematically, physically you will not get the same answer. Because you end up with the direct problem and you, like the first example I showed, you can have different boundary conditions to give you the same answer. And I can show you almost any problem in fluid mechanics and in heat transfer that the same result can be obtained by different boundary conditions. You can change the temperature here, you can change the heat flux here, you'll get the same answer. So as long as you can get the same answer by different boundary conditions, this is going to be non-unique. So even if you put physics in it, the physical problem is such that it's non-unique. So you, you just cannot make it unique by simply putting more constraints on it. Maybe you have a many sensors, but you still don't solve. Well, a lot of people have said, let's do data mining. Let's put a million uh, points up there. Let's put uh, ma machine learning in it, and you'll get the answer. Uh, to some extent, that is a valid point. But first of all, you have to put all those points in there. Experimentally, it's not, not going to be an easy matter. On that plume, if you put a 1,000 points, it's going to be, each point is very expensive. So that is the first thing. Secondly, I mean, yeah, machine learning will give you an idea, your data mining it and so on, but still the physics is not there. You still have the same problem. The fundamental problem still, that is not unique. The movie Twister, right? They yes. put all the sensors yeah. in the Twister. Uh, I, I actually have a question for you uh, based on an article you wrote right after the World Trade Center went down. And you actually calculated what the temperature on the beams were and why the building failed. Can you talk about how you got to that? Because Dr. Jaluri actually wrote an article. Was it New York Times? New York Times. New York Bas Times. Basically, what happens is that as you, a lot of people kept on saying that the steel uh, melted. Actually, it doesn't have to melt. If you plot the strength versus temperature, you find that by around six, seven hundred, it has already lost more than half its value. So the strength goes down. So it's basically the question. What I calculated was uh, coming to the kneeling point, but much before that, the strength had gone down to about half. And once it becomes much weaker, the floors fall down, and then you have the usual pancake effect, and the whole thing comes down. So that was what uh, we were talking about, because people kept on talking about melting point. They said, oh, it never reached the melting point. Why did the building fall? The question is not the melting point. It's simply softening or lowering of the yield strength. The yield strength changes very rapidly with temperature. Once you are beyond three or 400, it changes very, very rapidly. So when you were doing a lot of your uh, like optimization problem, it seemed like a lot of your calculations were done with a, like a really known system. So you had like like known parameters for like what area you're working in. Is this very extendable to like a, a more unknown physical situation where you don't have like good ideas of like what parameters like the room might have or anything like that? You could go to those, but you will have to make sure that the constraints are appropriate. See, in our case, we knew the constraints. We knew what the problem was. We found that if the fire was put on the ground the problem becomes much more difficult because then you have the quanta effect going toward the wall. It still will duplicate something that we were talking about, but the problem becomes more complicated. So if you go to a domain where the constraints are not known, the limitations of the domain are not known, it becomes a more complicated problem. But we have used this for many other problems. 
I mean, this strategy was used for micro channels. We used it for uh, electronic thermal management systems, and we find that most of them work, but you do need to know the constraints and the limitations of the boundary. Any other questions? <laughs> Thank you so much for the, for the talk, uh, very nice. So uh, here, uh, you mentioned that the solution uh, generally not unique. So uh, this solution means the, the inverse problem solution, right? Um, my question is, what if the system itself is kind of have multiple solutions, and then you use this inverse problem to find the boundary condition or whatever, you know? Can you comment on a little bit? You, you could have a case where there are multiple solutions. There are cases. And in fluid mechanics, I just refer to it very quickly, yeah. that if you have a fire or a source, you could have circulation that you go up in temperature, and that would change the situation. So when we started this with the room fire, with the thermocouple on the door, we found you really needed much more constraint to get the unique answer. You put thermocouple on, the, like I mentioned, back draft. If you put thermocouple to see when the flashover will occur, very often it will not work because you have multiple solutions. And in that case, you will need to put constraints on the basis of physics in it. Otherwise, you won't get it. Uh, the problem is, by nature, multiple. And that's the problem. All right, this is, uh, uh, you know, just to uh, remind you that you are here. <laughs> uh, more importantly for us to, uh, you know, give you something to remember your visit to NC State. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, it looks very nice. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Very nice.